Here I have a map. This map shows the route to go from Cameron Heights Collegiate to Knollwood Park. Both routes have exactly the same starting place and finishing place. Both of them have exactly the same change in time, but one is a different length. We do use this concept also in chemistry in something called Hess's Law. Let's look more specifically at what Hess's Law says. The idea is that the enthalpy change for any chemical reaction doesn't depend on the route, provided your starting conditions and final conditions, as well as reactants and products, are all the same. Let's map this out a couple of different ways. Suppose I want to take the chemical sulfur and turn it into sulfur dioxide. That'll acquire the addition of oxygen, as well as some enthalpy change. And then I'm going to take that sulfur dioxide and turn it into sulfur trioxide in a second step. That also will require some oxygen and there'll be an associated enthalpy change. Now, what Hess's law essentially says that I could go to sulfur trioxide via two different routes. I could follow this blue route that involves two steps, or I could do it in this one step. And the idea here would be that the enthalpy change would be the same for both. So here, let's show how that would look mathematically. And there's a mathematical statement then of Hess's law for associated with this diagram. A little rearrangement of this equation, if I move delta H over to the other side, it now looks like this. And a little bit about this. Negative delta H3 means I would be going in the other direction. The red arrow would be pointing from sulfur trioxide up to sulfur itself. That would thereby complete the cycle, arriving and finishing at sulfur. If you think about that, there's no energy change. And that makes sense. If one follows the law of conservation of energy, you can't create it or destroy it. And if I start and finish at the same place, I'm not making any overall change in energy. Let's look at this in another way. Here I have the first reaction written out, as well as its associated change in enthalpy. And there's the second step shown. If I add these two steps together, I get the red arrow, the description of going from sulfur to sulfur trioxide. Thereby, I just add together their two heats, and I also arrive at the overall enthalpy change for that reaction. Now, these two methods essentially communicate the same idea. Hess's law is, can be communicated in what's called enthalpy cycles, and that's what you see here. That'll be covered in the next program. I can also get it by equation rearrangement, and I'm going to cover that more in this program. And finally, we can use heats of formation data and Hess's law to predict the heat of a reaction. So we're going to look at three different ways of communicating Hess's law. But for now, equation rearrangement. Let's look at this example. I have here a particular reaction, carbon and hydrogen and oxygen, making methanol. And I'd like to know the heat for that reaction. I'm given three other reactions or three other experiments that have been taken place with their associated enthalpy changes. This first equation I call the target equation. This is what I want to finish up with when I add all my equations together. So let's begin by looking at equation number one. The first thing I notice here is the presence of methanol in both of them. Methanol is unique to the first equation and unique to the overall target equation. But I do notice a problem that they're on the wrong sides. Now, what I mean by on the wrong sides is in the target, it's a product, and in the equation one, it's a reactant. So essentially what I would like to do is switch that or reverse that. To do that, I'm gonna multiply equation number one by minus one. That'll flip my products and reactants. The other thing it does is change the enthalpy from exothermic to endothermic. And that indeed does make sense. If I go in the other direction, instead of a reaction being exothermic, it now becomes endothermic. So here I've shown the equation manipulated and changed. The next thing I'm going to do is go to equation number two. What I notice in it is the presence of carbon. Carbon is unique to equation two and my target. I do notice they're both on the same side, so I don't need to flip the equation. And there's one of each, so I don't have to do anything to this equation. I'm just going to leave it the way it is, and I'll rewrite it here. Now my third and final equation, if I take a look at it, I notice the presence of hydrogen. Hydrogen is in both of these equations. In both of them, it's a reactant. But in my target equation, I require two hydrogens. So I'm going to double equation number three, as well as the associated heat term that goes with it. 
Now, let's add these equations together to check that they add up to the target. To do that, I'm going to cancel out species that are common to both sides of the equation. So, for instance, carbon dioxide is both a reactant and a product, so I can cancel them. The two water molecules are common to both sides. Now, the oxygen, there's one and a half on this side, so I can cancel it with the one here, as well as half of this one. So, what I'm left with now when I add up the overall equations is this. This matches my target equation. Therefore, I'm starting and finishing at the same place. As a result, I can put together their heats and figure out the overall heat for this reaction as negative 202 kilojoules. Let's try another one. So there's my target equation again. This is where I want to finish. Examining equation number one, I notice present in it HCl and NaCl, both unique to equation one and the target. So I'll work with the HCl. The first thing I notice is that my given equation, the HCl is on the wrong side. So I'm going to have to multiply this by negative 1. And the next thing I notice is the coefficient of 2 in front of HCl. So I'm going to have to multiply it by negative a half. Also, the heat term. So here's the new equation. Now I'll go to equation number 2. Examining equation number 2, I see that sodium nitrite is common. But again, I have two of them, and they're on the wrong side. So again, I'll multiply by negative a half. And here's the equation. Now equation number three. I notice H and O2 common, but again, they're on the wrong side and the coefficient is off. So I need to also multiply by negative a half again. Now at this point, I don't see any species in equation four that's in my target. Perhaps I don't need that equation. But let's look a little bit more carefully at what would happen if I was to add up the species right now. So. Let's go back over to the right-hand side and cancel out some of the species that are common. So first of all, sodium oxide. There's half of them on each side. I can cancel them out. I can also cancel out half of the water. And that's all that I can really cancel out at this time. And if I was to add the equation together at this point, I would see the presence of oxygen, dinitrogen oxide, nitrogen dioxide, nitrogen monoxide. All of these chemicals would now be present that aren't in my target equation. So examining equation number four, I can see I can remove the oxygen by multiplying that equation four by a half. And when I do so, I'll now arrive at this equation. The presence of these will now cancel out some of my unwanted species. So there I've got rid of the nitrogen monoxide, nitrogen dioxide, my oxygen gas, and my dinitrogen oxide. Now when I add up the equation, I do arrive at my target. So as a result, I can add together their enthalpy changes and get the overall enthalpy change for this reaction. So this is a quick look at equation rearrangement. In the next program, we'll look at enthalpy cycles, and then we'll look at the use of heats of formation. Thanks for watching, and questions are always welcome.